Michael Tallinger is a researcher, scientist, author, and explorer. He's written four books, and he was best known for his earliest book, or one of his early books, which is Slave Species of the Gods. And he is with us today on Exa Politics Today to talk about his research, his discoveries concerning these ancient artifacts in Southern Africa, and his solutions to what confronts humanity. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome, Michael, to Exopolitics Today. Lovely to see you, Michael. It's been a long time. Uh, you're a regular um, face and uh, a colleague that I used to bump into for I guess nearly ten years, uh, every year at the at the Contact in the Desert conferences. But um, my last visit there was in 2019, so it's good to see you again. Yes, it's great to see you again. Now I know you uh, graduated uh, from medical school in pharmacology, so why don't you tell us about your your uh, science medicine uh, medical background and how you got into uh, becoming a kind of author and researcher. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, well, you know, I, I somehow ended up in, in the School of Pharmacy at Wits Medical School, just for people that don't know South African universities, Wits uh, stands as a short abbreviation for the University, university of the Witwatersrand, otherwise known as Wits, uh, W-I-T-S. Um, and uh, it is it was for many years, actually, the one of the major medical schools in the world uh, and all the doctors from this medical school were sought after all over the world and you still find them all over the world that graduated more or less at the same time and before and after so anyway i um i ended up there you know because i was interested in anatomy and biology and and so forth and uh, graduated it's a five-year degree uh and uh, it was in, in pharmaceutics and pharmacology and uh, and the school of pharmacy and um and uh, I didn't really um, spend much time in that. I worked for several years in both um, retail and in manufacturing pharmaceutics, manufacturing drugs and everything you can imagine. Um, and, um, and then I realized that uh, that was not my calling because I was also a musician. I came out of the music industry and arts and culture and theater. Uh, so while I was studying, I actually was doing a lot of uh, music and theater while I was at, at uh, medical school. So. Uh, I started to do research and read alternative books, and uh, by the time I turned 30, uh, the penny had dropped for me that something is, is not quite right. So, and that's when I discovered the, the, the works of Zachariah Sitchin, and I think, um, and also William Bramley, Gods of Eden, I think those were the, the books that really triggered me, um, which was about 10 years after I was originally triggered in my first year at university. <laughs> by the one and only Eric von Däniken, who since became a friend uh, at Contact in the Desert and his classic book, uh, Chariots of the Gods. So that started my journey. You know, we all have our trigger points and our journeys. And I started to ask questions to which your audience knows very well. They aren't very definitive answers. And uh, that led me to my own, um, I guess, uh, 20 years of research. And uh, by the time I turned 41, I then sat down and, and wrote Slave Species of God, um, which um, which turned out to be, you know, a bestseller on, on Amazon, which blew my mind. Well, sounds like you went through a very similar journey to, to myself. I, I, I remember uh, reading William B uh, Bramley's Gods of Eden, and I thought that was a fantastic book for describing uh, the origins of uh, international conflict and the, the role of these extraterrestrials in that and the Anunnaki and, of course, Zechariah Sitchin. Uh, his books were very influential when I began my my journey. And, of, and of course, uh, the eternal Eric von Daniken. I mean, I can think everyone's been influenced by him at, at some point. So, yeah, very, very similar roles. So, yeah, this book uh, that you wrote, uh, the slave species of the gods. I mean, it's a it's a fabulous title, and yeah, as you said, it became a, a bestseller. So, you want to tell us a little bit about what what inspired you to to write that? 
Um, thank you, Michael. Uh, I must just point out that the original version of this book, this is the re-edited version with some other juicy bits in it that was released by uh, Bear & Co. Inner Traditions in the USA. Uh, the original version of the book uh, is called Slave Species of God, God spelled with a small g, which caused a huge uh, confusion. You can imagine why do you want to write God with a small g? And there was a very specific reason why I wrote God with a small g, because I was referring to the gods, uh, the, the Anunnaki, right? And not God, the creator of the universe and all things in it, the primordial source code and, and, and consciousness of creation. Uh, this was a, a whole new uh, alternative way of thinking. And I wanted people to pay attention to that. So, uh, and, and in South Africa, that caused a lot of, uh, you know, turbulence and I was invited by churches and church groups to come and talk about this book and how dare I spell God with a small g and what I found fascinating is that in those early days from 2006 2007 2008 I was doing those early lectures on slave species of God and the whole idea that humanity was cloned by an extraterrestrial species and how crazy that might sound and the Nephilim and the Anakim and the Zamzumim and the Gibberim and all those uh, those strange creatures we read about in the Bible and, and other uh, ancient texts. Um, what I found interesting is that the, the churches and the Christians were actually very open to this, which I did not expect. Uh, and, um, and that definitely uh, made me wake up a little bit and start, uh, it, it triggered something inside me, that there's, a, there's definitely a channel for us to discuss this without people becoming antagonistic and actually digging through the physical evidence and uh, which when you go through the ancient scripts and ancient Sumerian clay tablets that you know, Zachariah Sitchin introduced me to, um, when you start going through that, you also then sooner or later stumble on, on, the, on the ancient scrolls and, uh, and all those other ancient texts that are not just the Bible or the Sumerian clay tablets. And, and you know what happens next. It just becomes like this you know, never-ending quest for, for new knowledge and, and information. So with uh, Zechariah Sitchin, uh, he really emphasized this struggle between the, the two half-brothers, Enlil and Enki, in terms of uh, Earth's future and, and how humanity uh, was to be treated. And so, you know, did you kind of like broadly uh, agree with uh, Zechariah Sitchin in terms of, I think he portrayed Enki as pretty much the more benevolent God that wanted to kind of like help humanity evolve, uh, reach a fullest potential, whereas Enlil was more into just exploiting humanity as, as workers and just, uh, you know, driving them hard to, you know, you know pl plunder the gold mines, wherever. Uh, yes, uh, I would say so. I think I reached that conclusion quite soon in, in the reading of, of Zachariah Sitchin's work, but then also other works. It's just what it's it's difficult to define why you reach a conclusion. It's 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 the subtext, it's what you get between the lines, what you read between the lines, you know. And that jumped out to at me very strongly. And it was only really probably recently, probably about eight years ago or so now, when I was introduced to um to the works of Anton Parks, which is obviously a very important figure in Sumerian text translations. In fact, I think he's become the, the number one, in my opinion, this is my opinion, the number one um, expert in the Sumerian text translations and his whole edition uh, volume of knowledge that he's brought to that uh, body of research. And uh, Anton uh, Parks very clearly uh, spells out that Enki was a very, well, I don't want to use the word high conscious uh, consciousness, but he was a very different kind of individual or entity than than what we could imagine. Um, he also talks about the many other beings other than the Anunnaki, um, the, the the so many other beings that were on Earth in those days and over mill millions of years prior to that and since, and the battles between those entities as well. So there's a whole lot more to the Anunnaki story than we could imagine. Um, I do think that Zachariah Sitchin does cover it in some, some areas. He touches upon it, but he doesn't go into the detail. Like in one of his books, uh, The Pyramid Wars, I believe, where he talks about the Pyramid Wars and all that uh, fascinating story. 
But however, uh, to come back to the, the Enlil Enki situation, Enki is un unquestionably, uh, in my mind right now, uh, the, the, su the supreme Anunnaki being with, with the vision and the capacity to, to comprehend love, uh, compassion, unity, cooperation. And uh, I believe that he encoded all that in our DNA. Uh, there's the whole story of the ME tablets that that were that Anunnaki held for some time, and the the ME tablets were encoded with all the knowledge and information of the universe and all the secrets of the universe and so forth. And if you recall, Sitchin does go over those that story of the ME tablets and how the Anunnaki somehow misplaced it. Some of the senior Anunnaki took control of it, and they wanted to. <laughs> they wanted to control the, whether they were physical tablets or ethereal or who knows what. I find it fascinating that they're called the ME tablets, as in English, me, right? And at the same time, they contained all the knowledge and information. And Enki was the custodian and the guardian of those tablets, supposedly, according to Sitchin. And I believe that um, there was a time that uh, while he was cloning this new species, he wanted to hide that information somewhere so it could never be destroyed. And he put it in our DNA. And that for me, when, I, when that penny dropped for me, I realized, oh my God, we as a species are infinitely powerful and infinitely valuable to other beings of or malicious beings who want to get to the, to the knowledge that's encoded in our DNA. And, you know, we just started waking up uh, realizing that our DNA is such a powerful um, uh, molecule that can contain so much knowledge and information that you can store information in DNA and so much more. Um, that for me is a very important part of the Anunnaki story, which I don't think Sitchin went there. And I'm not sure if Anton Parks goes there, but I, I digressed a little bit, Michael. What I wanted to come back to, Anton Parks makes it very clear that Enki and Enlil were not brothers. They were not brothers, they were not half brothers. And he, he gives all kinds of reasons and translations that, that he, uh, he claims that um, Enlil was Enki's clone. Enki cloned Enlil to be his sidekick or his clone. Uh, and that clone went rogue and wanted to become the master. And uh, that, to me, that blew my mind when that uh, when I realized when I learned that from Anton Parks's work. Yeah, that's 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 fascinating. Uh, you know, because uh, I know uh, the uh, Garden of Eden story um, is really central to uh, you know the, the Judeo-Christian traditions, and and of course you have this interplay between uh, you know the, the God overlooking or in charge of the, the garden, and then there's the serpent that's trying to uh, play a role in that. And so I, I thought that was uh, very interesting in terms of. It seems that you know the Garden of Eden it had uh, the uh, tree of knowledge and the tree of life, and it was as far. And and here you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but I my kind of conclusion reading that story and also the story of Adapa is that. Enlil was quite happy to have uh, the, the created humans eat from the tree of life because he just wanted workers, but he didn't want them to be awakened. Whereas Enki was more interested in, in having uh, humans awakened. So he wanted them to eat of the tree of knowledge. And so, yeah, it, I mean, yeah, can you com comment on that? Because that's embedded within our DNA in some way. Yeah, that's a very important story. And I think it's a story that all of us, including me, have completely misinterpreted and misvisualized in our minds, you know, because when, when you grow up with the Bible and the Garden of Eden and this lovely place that Adam and Eve were put into and it was this, this wonderful Never Never Land or whatever utopian place, well, that's not exactly what it is. Uh, and... And, you know, here sitting in South Africa with Adam's calendar, which is at this stage, it seems like the place where the, the whole deed of, of the final step of cloning and creating the, the, this new species, the Adamu species, um, 
that um, that it took place here at Adam's calendar um, and some of the channelings that I've had over the years and the the psychics and the the the, the shamans uh, especially Craig Baba Kredo Mutwa that shared a lot of information with me uh, in the several times that I met with him uh, regarding the creation and uh, remember that uh, Kredo Mutwa believes that Adam's calendar is where humanity was created by the gods in other words Anunnaki to be the slaves in the gold mines so um, you know maybe you can show the cover of Adam's calendar there because uh, what what we're looking yeah that's those are the central stones at Adam's calendar um, and and this this cover this cover is the original cover which is very misleading um, because we now know that Adam's calendar is 300 actually a little bit more than 300,000 years old uh, and there are various reasons why I can say that um, so so uh, what led up to this from all the accumulated knowledge and research and channelings and interviews that I've done with various psychics, people and shamans. And as I said, since I discovered Adam's calendar through Jan Heiner, his, because remember Jan Heiner discovered or rediscovered Adam's calendar, uh, which is known in Shama, African shamanic tradition as Inzalo Yelanga, Inzalo Yelanga, which means birthplace of the sun. And not the sun as in the sun rising, but the sun, the sun of the gods, birthplace of the sun where humanity was created by the gods or the Anunnaki uh, to be the slaves in the gold mines. So you can't make this stuff up. But the important thing here is that <clears throat> in the beginning, the species that was cloned, the first Adamu species, the slave race, whose pure purpose was to be the slaves in the gold mines, but they had the already the DNA, the component to be able to elevate themselves to higher consciousness. But that wasn't turned on yet. That came later. So for about 5,000 years or so, but this is again from my channelings and, and past life regressions and so forth. Um, that first slave race, the Adamu race, that, which, was, which was predominantly masculine, didn't have um, genitalia to procreate. So they could not procreate. They were strong, masculine, and they could work. They were good workers. They, they spent a lot of time cloning the species so they wouldn't be, they, they, need to, they had to be smart enough and intelligent enough to understand consequence. Okay, this is really important for people to understand. If you haven't contemplated it, you can't take gorillas and enslave gorillas to work in gold mines. It's not going to work. Or chimpanzees. They don't understand consequence, right? They, they, they won't understand if you tell them, if you don't do this, we're going to hurt you or punish you or chop your arm off or, or hurt your sister or anything like that. So this was in the cloning process, the genetic manipulation is one of the key things to have to, to experience pain. This is why we have this pain thing and to understand consequence and to be easily uh, manipulated through uh, brainwashing and, and threats and yet be smart enough to follow instructions and repeat um, manual labor and be able to do complex things, sometimes complex things, while you don't um, question wh why you are doing it. So this is not an easy thing to do. And it took them a long, long time with them being the Anunnaki. It took them a long time to get that balance right. And in the process for a long time, I mean, probably several thousand years, they were experimenting with different species, with different shapes and sizes of creatures. And I would suggest that we are... Every now and then when, when we make a, a discovery of some weird creature with some weird skeleton that doesn't fit into you know, what we believe our history is, is possibly and potentially one of these creatures that may have been cloned and created and birthed at some stage. Um, so again, these are just, this is my current conclusion based on researching this for you know 20 years and living here and look, finding these sites and discovering the tools and artifacts. And we're gonna to get to those as well. But that whole, this is really important the, the whole cloning process, the ideas, the thoughts behind it. What is a species gonna to have to look like? What are the characteristics? The, the philosophical profile, 
you know, physiological profile, anatomical profile, and so forth. And um, yeah, it's uh, very exciting. Well, one of the things that has fascinated me is that when I read some of the Egyptian uh, authors like Manitho, you look at the King's List uh, from uh, Samaria, you look at the, 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 the Old Testament, uh, it talks about uh, people having these long lives of about a thousand years, whether you call them demigods, whether you call them the patriarchs, they live for about a thousand years. Then you have the flood event, and then the human lifespan shortens very, very quickly. And so by the time of like uh, David, King David, uh, you know, the human lifespan is pretty much what we know it. So so, so what happened? I mean, what, was it like uh, in the time of the patriarchs, in the time of Methuselah and Enoch, uh, did they have direct access to their Anunnaki DNA? Were they able to kind of like access it and were more long lived and somehow that access was cut off with their successes after the great flood what what do you know of that that's a really good question michael and a very important question because i'm sure a lot of people are, are, are contemplating that and i must say there's probably not a not an answer that that i can that i can bring forward with absolute confidence say this is what it is right because we just don't know the one thing that comes to mind, however, is that what I do know today is that we can manipulate our DNA to live a lot longer than we live right now. And, and I say this from, from knowing the people that create this genetic technology. Obviously, that technology is not going to be released because that just, that's just, <laughs> you can't do that. So the the interesting thing is uh, while we're on that subject you know imagine if you discovered like some people that i've met the uh, it's a very simple genetic manipulation that can make you live a thousand years or two thousand years what are you going to do with it are you just going to release it to the market no that's that is just a recipe for absolute disaster can you imagine an unconscious global population of people that are just trying to buy fancy cars and get as rich as they can and abuse others and and become the king of the 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 king of the mountain and just abuse others imagine releasing that kind of drug to this kind of society i mean that's just that's a recipe for non-stop perpetual warfare and conflict so you can't release that i suspect that obviously the anunnaki knew the the formula for uh, for longevity because they did live for a long long time potentially infinitely and, uh, and I suspect that some of their chosen humans, their chosen among the people, were given specific drugs or medicine or potions, whatever you want to call it, that would, that would ad adapt their or uh, adjust their DNA so they would live a little bit longer. Not, not live as long as Anunnaki, but definitely live longer. If we can do it today, they certainly could do it in those days while they were cloning this new species and, and uh, you know, play, playing around on Earth because it was, it was their, pretty much their playground, together with all these other strange beings, that some of whom were brutal, despicable, and bloodthirsty. In, in terms of uh, the mines, uh, the gold mines in Southern Africa, I mean, that's where it, the, the story of... Uh, the Anunnaki, Zechariah Sitchin's interpretations of the cuneiform texts uh, takes on that interesting element because uh, you've actually done research there in Southern Africa and you found evidence uh, that these uh, ancient mines that are uh, described in uh, the Sumerian texts actually do exist and that these were in fact built by the Anunnaki using uh, that slave labor and maybe even predate the arrival of the Anunnaki. So you want to talk about the, the mines in Southern Africa and how the Anunnaki got the human workers to exploit those for them? Um, yes, um, that is obviously one of the reasons that I ended up here in the province of Mpumalanga um, and, and opened my lodge and the Stone Circle Museum. And I came here to start researching the Stone Circles in 2007, literally a year and a half after releasing my book, Slave Species of God. I, I was introduced to Jan Heine, and he showed me the stone circles of Southern Africa, which I've read about before, but very little uh, um, photographic material existed. 
uh, Johann Heine had hundreds of aerial photographs of the ruins that not very few people had seen before. So that obviously blew my mind and I realized instantly when I saw that we are dealing with the work of the Anunnaki. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I moved out here and I'm still here now. Um, and that took me into the research of the Anunnaki presence here, the ancient gold mines. And uh, it's pretty much every gold mine in this part of the world is most likely an ancient mine that was just reopened by the, the, the settlers, the pioneers uh, in the mid to late 1800s when they rediscovered the gold and rediscovered these mines. So they discovered these mines here. They reopened them, started working on them. And then probably about 20 years later, they discovered the, or 15 years later or so, they discovered the, the gold on the, on the reef up in Johannesburg. And, and, and that was, um, the gold there was slightly um, richer. So they moved all their attention up there. But it didn't stop here. So um, where we are, right, where I'm still right now here right now and uh, what's interesting is that adam's calendar is uh, the more the more i studied it the more you let it filter in as you know michael this is not something that you can just arrive and look okay boom 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 blah, 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 and okay i got it i understand it and yeah that's it thank you very much i can go away i've now i've seen that i've been there seen that uh, and <laughs> that's not how it works you got it takes years and years of observing and sometimes and, and not just observing, let it filter in, let it sit in file 13 and, and reach for it at a time where you need to try and figure out something that doesn't make any sense. And slowly but surely you start connecting the dots. And that's what makes it such a great journey of discovery is that it, it literally becomes like building a puzzle with pieces that are scattered all over the place and you just find a missing piece that's out of place and suddenly you go, oh my God, it fits in here and so forth. So. There's, there's overwhelming evidence of ancient gold mines, and I'm talking tunnels, ancient tunnels underground uh, that, that were created by the Anunnaki, that they were mining gold in. Um, we've, and those are discovered over the last 120, 150 years already. Many of these ancient tunnels have been discovered, and I found the, the reports of those discoveries with weird tools left behind that they didn't understand. All those tools are obviously confiscated by the mining authorities in those days never to be released to anybody uh, up to very recent times as recently as 2015 um, a, an acquaintance a, a friend of a friend that came to spend a weekend with me at the stone circle lodge and museum um, he he told me that um, one of his best friends works in a gold mine uh, on cult uh, on the other side of johannesburg where i grew up on the gold on the gold reef on the gold mines um, and uh, what happened there is one of their main underground tunnels, one of the big tunnels, caved in and, uh, and it opened up a, another tunnel that was like absolutely perfectly chiseled and tunneled that was just not supposed to be there. So <laughs> what happens then is they instantly shut the mine down and shut that part of the mine down. No one's allowed to go in there. They sent in their team, whoever goes in there and... Um, and that was it. No one ever hears about it again. Then obviously they are the, the, the stories of geologists that I've interviewed. And in fact, you can see the videos on my, on my, um, on my private channel, um, how the geologists were called into mines in the eighties. And these mines are here opposite Adam's calendar, by the way. And that's what makes it so fascinating because they discovered a huge underground cavern. He says it's larger than, than the Vatican. And in the side of this giant underground cathedral, uh, there are these holes that come out. Some of them have gold that oozes out of these, like they're like veins of gold, solid gold oozing out of these veins. And some of the veins, but very slowly, like very thick, slow moving jelly, like tar, just slowly oozing out. And, um, and then some of these veins that where the gold has been extracted and there's nothing. And the, the reason this geologist was called in, who was a consulting geologist in the mining industry in the 80s, so I get the story directly from him, he got called in there to come and investigate this very strange occurrence or strange phenomenon they discovered. Uh, again, when they discovered this huge sort of, you know, Vatican-sized underground cave, um, uh, they shut it down, no one, no one was allowed in there. 
He came in, they investigated it. And the reason they wanted to investigate it is because they wanted to know who would have the kind of technology to extract the gold out of those veins without blasting because they don't know how to do it. And yet somebody removed the gold without blasting the rock. So th this is how they think, right? They want to know what technology they can use to get the gold out. They're not thinking about this is some ancient technology and Anunnaki activity. That's not how their minds work. So, so when I say there's evidence of Anunnaki gold mines here and Anunnaki technology, it's not because I think so. I've got some weird happy feeling about it. I'm just giving you a fraction of the evidence that I've that I've dealt with and uh, over the last um, 15 years now, I guess since 2007. Well, I know there's this uh, lion cavern that uh, yes. is on your website that you've taken people to view, and and that's kind of evidence that there are these ancient mines there in South Africa. Now, this one says yeah. uh, the sign says it's. Uh, hematite it's uh, it, that it's a hematite mine but I mean yes. yeah can you tell us about this uh, lion cavern and what what's real what how does that fit into you know what you've just been telling us about well it's it's interesting this is an interesting place um, there are gold mines nearby uh, that's for sure um, but again uh, very secret very quiet um, this is right on the border of South Africa and Swaziland, uh, the province of Mpumalanga and Swaziland. It literally is, as the crow flies, probably um, 150, 200 kilometers from, from where I'm sitting right now, maybe a little bit further. Um, and um, so you literally drive from South Africa over the border and the first turn off you get to, you turn left and, and then you go up the mountain and when you, if these guys that are standing there, if they turn around and face the other way, you actually see South Africa from there. That's, that's how close it is. So this is all in the same gold mining area that the Anunnaki were present. Um, and, and just remind me to come back to Adam's calendar and why Adam's calendar is located where it is. It's very, very important why they put it there. Um, but so this lion's cavern, um, uh, Peter Beaumont is the guy that actually excavated a very famous South African archaeologist who is very conscious and very spiritual. Um, you know, he he spoke about the, the spiritual journeys and the out-of-body experiences of the Bushman people. He wrote books about it. I think uh, uh, um, Graham Hancock did quite a few, did some interviews with Peter Beaumont when he was here and, uh, and, and used some of those stories in his books. Um, uh, Peter Beaumont died um, recently. And, um, and he was one of the definitely open-minded archaeologist in South Africa and um, and uh, he excavated this and the, his his uh, assessment of the age of that mine is much older than what the official statements are he says that it's, it's at least a hundred thousand years old okay at least not not a hundred thousand years he says it's at least a hundred thousand years old and that's because of they found coal, they found man-made fires with coal at a strata level that would be 100,000 years ago. So um, again, the age of these uh, mines is, is very open to interpretation. However, I, if I'm not mistaken, this remains the oldest mine in the world in mainstream archaeology. I think it's 40, is it 43,000 years or something uh, on that plaque that it said? I forget now. So these are some of the places that we used to go to in our sacred sites tours that I did every year, one or two of those tours to bring people to Southern Africa and take them to all these places, including Great Zimbabwe, Sadila Hills, Northern Botswana, right there on the, on the border of, of uh, Angola and Namibia. And these are all spectacularly beautiful places. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I think, very fondly of those, of those days um, before COVID, the, the pandemic that destroyed all our lives to some in some way or another. <laughs> I know you talked about a civilization in Southern Africa that actually predated the arrival of the Anunnaki, that the Anunnaki came about 200,000 years ago and, and, and did their, their ex genetic experiments and their mining and so forth, but that there was an earlier civilization there. So can you tell us uh, you know, who was there? Okay. Um... <clears throat> I'm not sure what you're referring to. There might be misinterpretation there. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, when I talk about these ancient civilizations in South Africa uh, or Southern Africa, which is South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Swaziland, all these countries, because it was all one piece of land. So there were no borders in those days, obviously. Um, so uh, I, I really am referring to the Anunnaki that were here. They seem to be the first settlers here that came for the gold. Um, there may have been other creatures here, like the, the hominids, the Homo erectus, and so forth. How they came to be, I have no idea. At this stage, I don't know. Uh, what we do know, and what we have physical evidence of, is that the Bushmen were here at least 250,000 years ago. We have caves along the coastal Cape, uh, the, 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 the Cape coastal areas, uh, where the Bushmen in, were inhabiting caves for, for 250,000 years. You can literally see the strata there with the with the the, the fish the, the shells that they were consuming the oysters and and all the different seafood that they were eating and how it piles up over the years and you can see the timeline 250,000 years so the bushmen have been here for an incredibly long time when i say bushmen i mean the the sand the khoisan people and that that you know that expression khoisan opens a whole other can of worms in our lack of comprehension and misnaming and mislabeling certain ancient cultures and peoples because of a lack of information. So uh, I call them the Bushmen because they like to be called that, by the way. They say we like to be called Bushmen. We're not so happy with San and, and Khoisan and all that. So <laughs> yeah. Or the okay. San Qua. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, so that so that was me um, not quite um getting it right the, the way you described the history in Southern Africa. So yeah. the Anunnaki were there. They they were first there and they created the, the human civilizations there. So that yeah. takes me to this evidence that emerged, uh, I think a decade ago, there was a book about this Boscop skull and they talked about the Boscop man there in, in Southern in southern Africa. So um, yeah, so were these uh, Boscop, I mean, these were apparently, uh, they preceded Homo sapiens. So is, were these one of those races or one of these types of humans that were built by the Anunnaki? Yeah, that's exactly what I was referring to earlier. Whenever you find something like this, it's most likely one of those beings that was, um, you know, it was one of the experiments uh, of the Anunnaki. The Neanderthal could have been another one. Yeah. Uh, and so forth. So uh, it's just so vague. Uh, for anyone to try and make a definitive statement about this is just incredibly egotistic. So I just say, you know, I'd like to say it's, it's fantastic discovery. Um, great to know that there was all kinds of stuff going on here. But what we have here in South Africa and Southern Africa, especially South Africa and Zimbabwe, is the evidence of this ancient civilization that I refer to. And the evidence are the stone circles, the stone circle ruins that are, you know, not just a few of them. We're talking about 10 million. So this is not a small, this is not a little discovery. This is, this is a mind bending, unimaginable achievement in architecture and construction that is, in my mind, more impressive than any pyramids built anywhere on earth. Because once you've walked the stone circles and you've walked the channels and the terraces, the mind boggles because what you can't see in this photograph, this is a this is a, a lovely photograph of one of the sort of more preserved sun circles not far from here. This is where I normally take people on on tour if they want to see uh, you know examples of stone circles. But uh, what you can see is the internal structures are, are very strange and bizarre and so forth. And and it's important to know that uh, these stone circles are cymatic patterns. OK, if you if you show some of the other aerial photographs, if you find them, um, and in that, uh, in that, uh, on that page, um, you start seeing the complexity of the internal structures of the stone circles, and that's because each stone circle is just a reflection uh, or a representation of the cymatic pattern, the cymatic shape of the sound frequency that comes out of the earth at that specific point, and that is just incredible. We don't know how to do that today. I mean, we, we'd have to go to extreme links and thinking and planning to do that and these guys did this 10 million times and then they connected them with channels that connect them all together and with terraces that go down the mountains and through the valleys and up again and embrace all these stone circles this is unimaginable 
You know, we could build the Great Pyramid today if we wanted to, really, with 3D printing and precision stuff and that, we could build it, right? But we cannot do this. It's simply impossible. No, we can't even begin to fathom how to do this. Where do you start? Yeah, that's, yeah, th those are fascinating patterns. And you've talked uh, a couple of times now about these uh, stone circles with the, the holes in them. So you want to tell us, uh, you know, what are these? And I mean, you, you do have some Are some you pictures. talking about the Taurus stones? Yeah, the Taurus yeah, the, stones. Yeah, there yes. you go. Those, those these yeah. guys, I mean, uh, yeah, what are they? And how, how are these evidence of the Anunnaki presence and the gold mines? Well, what you might not have in this catalog of pictures is the is the is the picture of me in the museum. Oh, that's a very important one. That's that. Uh, no, the one with the cone next to it, the one below it. It's the Taurus stone and the cone. And that uh, that is, you know, when when you realize that the Taurus stones are energy generating devices. OK, in fact, it's that Taurus stone that you're looking at that crashed the TSA security system at Doha International Airport. In 2013, when I was on my way to the USA, I, uh, I was invited by Nassim Haramain to come and do a presentation to him and his uh, research scientist there in, on, on Kauai uh, Island. And um, so I thought I'd take him a nice present. So I thought, look, I can't, this can't be a cheapskate present. I've got to give Nassim something of true value. And I thought, okay, look, he's researching resonance, you know, the Resonance Institute. Um, and uh, so I thought, let, him, let me take him the best Taurus stone that I have. So I took this one. It broke my heart. I really broke my heart to part ways with it because it was like giving a child away. But I thought this will be my gift to Nassim because he's got this great research facility. He's going to research it and he's going to come up with, with you know, what these stones can actually do. We already knew at that stage that these stones are powerful energy generating devices, but we had no idea how powerful and 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 how they were most likely being used. But what I did at that stage already, I connected the Taurus stones as energy generating devices and the cone-shaped tools like the one next to it. And I, I then discovered that the cone-shaped tools together with the Taurus stones, but more so the cone-shaped tools are the missing element that all researchers and all archeologists have missed. I cannot believe that they missed it in all these years, 200, or more years of research in archaeology from Egyptology through to, you know, the, the Americas and, and, and Mexico and, and India and all over the world, they have missed the cone-shaped tools. And suddenly the cone-shaped tools jumped out at me everywhere in the Sumerian images, in, the, in Egypt, and uh, everywhere you go, they are cone-shaped tools used by ancient civilizations. And, uh, and suddenly it all became very clear to me that we're dealing with advanced technology, the Taurus stones, the cone-shaped tools, and then you add into it the magnetron shape, which is that flower shape. It looks like a beautiful flower, circle in the middle and the, and the petals around the outside with a stem coming out of it. Uh, some of the stone circles um, from the air look like uh, the flowers. Uh, they're beautiful, uh, what we call magnetron stone circles, and we have thousands of them, not just, not just a 10 or 100 literally thousands of the magnetron shaped stone circles. And uh, if you ask any magnetron scientist and you ask them how much energy will a magnetron that's 50 meters in diameter generate? And uh, literally the, the answer is generally more energy than all the power plants on earth combined. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but, um, but it's just insane. So we, we're dealing with the stone circles of Southern Africa, being a network of very powerful energy generating devices, energy generating technology, uh, they were all connected to each other and all uh, sharing and generating energy from the vibrations of the earth, amplifying it and then sharing it into the, the, the network grid. And somehow I think uh, it was being pushed up into the sky. Um, that's, what the, that's what some of the shamanic and um, and some of the measurements also show it uh, that actually suggest that energy is rising up to a certain level and then it connects there. Uh, this is obviously a lot, uh, much longer conversation because again, this is an accumulation of 15 years of research that could sound completely crazy to people that have just discovered this uh, body of research. 
But uh, keep in mind, if you if you look at my uh, lectures, you know, I have a lot of lectures and presentations on YouTube and especially on my private channel. So if you go to michaeltellinger.com, you can click there and join, join my channel. And there are thousands of hours of videos and research and interviews and presentations and lectures um, where I connect all the dots regarding this technology and this research. And I guess, again, let me just say it for the last time, I think my what I find mostly gratifying is that I was able to connect the dots because of my background knowledge, I could connect the dots between the sound, the resonance, the frequencies, the cone-shaped tools, the torus stones, and the magnetrons. And I went suddenly went, oh, boom, ding, ding, ding. Oh my God, we're dealing with ancient advanced technology. And these guys were building these. It's a giant energy generating machine. Well, this takes us to a really kind of fundamental issue here is that, you know, when we think of uh, early humans and and their use of stone tools, uh, we think of that as a sign of uh, kind of like a uh, you know primitiveness that uh, you know that's a stone age culture and and we are kind of in this uh, metals uh, culture where we you know can can use all these metal alloys to build advanced technologies but i've heard a number of uh, researchers identify stones as actually being um, an advanced technology just we just don't understand it and you know, and, and I, I think that uh, you know what you're what you've been pointing to is is very important. That the well, that everything you've seen there in Southern Africa, like these uh, tools, uh, these are uh, these rings, these torus shapes, that uh, these are a form of technology. And of course, here you have this image of I guess that's you uh, taking measurements of some um, emf being produced by this so is, is it i mean how do, how does it work is you know do these rocks do they have some sort of uh, quartz in them where yes. they they respond to the movement of the earth and generate a piezoelectric effect is that's what's giving off the energy uh, no no that's not that's not it uh, michael but let's just go back a little bit stone is absolutely advanced technology so keep in mind what is in stone all the stone on earth, unless it's a pure mineral, all the stone on earth, especially the granites and the sandstones, and that they are, they are at least 50% um, silica, quartz, right? So quartz is an advanced technology, right? Everything in modern technology is to do with quartz and fiber optics and silica, you know, if it's not silica, it's graphene. So it's silica and graphene and silica dioxide crystals. So it's unquestionably very advanced technology. And we have been dumbed down to believe that stones and stone tools and stone technology is primitive stone age. Stone age. Stone age does not mean stupid. Stone age means that you know how to use stones uh, as advanced weapons. And uh, remember, the cone-shaped tools are actually saser beams. Sorry, saser beam generators. Just let that sink in, right? When you put a sound frequency that's specifically created to go through those cone-shaped tools, You've literally turned yourself into a, 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 a conduit that generates that can generate a, a saser beam, and or a laser beam, but I mean, most most likely a saser beam because we're dealing with sound resonance and frequency. So so you could use your thoughts, your thoughts as a vibration and a frequency, and if you know how to channel that to your body through your arm into the cone that you're holding, that will then produce a saser beam coming out of your hand. And we see these images, the Anunnaki, the, or whatever you want to call them, the winged beings, the, the bird-headed winged beings holding the cones in their hands. And if you look carefully, there's a, there's a, on, the, on his watch is a, a magnetron kind of watch. When you see that, you go, oh, my goodness, that's an energy-generating device. And then leading into the little magnetron is another cone on his arm. So we got a cone on the arm leading into the magnetron, leading into a cone coming out of his hand, right? You go, okay, if you understand what I've just shared with you, that picture tells a thousand words because you comprehend that they're telling us they had absolute mastery of generating energy and focusing energy and doing using basic tools, stones as advanced tools and weapons as well, right? This is also a weapon, clearly. So never forget that. So so yes, uh, stone, stone Age doesn't mean uh, that it's uh, primitive. It means that they knew how to use 
courts and the shapes of the stones to their benefit. Now, to come back to the Torah stones, what you probably don't have there is the images that, that I've, I've shown uh, on my many channels, uh, my Telegram channel and, and my video channel and, and everywhere. Um, what it looks like when you photograph this, the Torah stone with, the, with a, a heat sensitive camera. Uh, and, and it very clearly shows you the one side generates heat, the other side sucks energy. One side generates energy, the other side sucks energy. So it sucks energy from the one side and it, and it amplifies it to the other side. And every one of those stones behaves the same way. So they are energy generating devices, the Taurus stones. And, um, and that's, I think, what happened uh, in Doha in 2013, when that stone that I was taking to Nassim uh, crashed the TSA security system in Doha, Qatar, and just caused havoc at the airport. They stopped the plane, they pulled me off the plane, there were six guys with guns, and, uh, and it, was, it was very dramatic. And um, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it is, it is amazing uh, when we consider that uh, stones can actually be a form of uh, advanced technology and they, you know, we might not recognize it because we think it's just you know, laying around. I mean, I've, I've heard stories that some spacecraft are literally made out of stone that the, that the that the the interior of the craft uses some kind of stone or quartz a uh, hematite uh, yeah that that's been mentioned um so yeah th definitely that does make sense there, there is one of the pictures i got from your website that i wanted to share because you talk about uh, the sphinxes or that there's a sphinx and pyramids uh, there in uh, southern Africa. So uh, I don't know. Is is this kind of related? Yeah. Uh, no, no. This is a this is a beautiful part of South Africa. This is the west coast. This is on the skeleton on the, on the west coast of South Africa in the Bushman's Bushman's Kloof, where there are hundreds of Bushman uh, rock art, Bushman paintings on the walls. So that's what we were doing there. That's my friend Dean Laprini. He's one of the one of the most incredible shamans in the world. Uh, he is a real African shaman with a very deep knowledge of the of the sun, the movements of the sun, the, the Bushman people, the rock paintings and the medicinal plants and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we used to do these sacred, sacred sites tours, Dean and myself um, across Southern Africa together. Okay, well, um... So just to talk about the Sphinx, uh, the Sphinx, because that actually is a, again, that leads to a whole nother chapter. So somewhere in those pictures uh, on, on my website, people can go look through it. There'll be a picture of, of this little Sphinx. It's probably about, you know, two meters, two and a half meters long when you stand next to it. It's, and, and, and it's got this little head and then the little back and, and it looks little, it's shaped like a little Sphinx. So when I first discovered that in 2008, I went, oh my God, this is a little sphinx. Why would, who would carve this little sphinx out of the stone? Because this is an Adam's calendar and this is dolerite stone. Dolerite is part of the granite family, right? So, um, and this is on top of, of the mountain right next to Adam's calendar. And the mountain is, is uh, sandstone, quartzite. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's known as black reef quartzite. So it's well-recognized quartz sediment. That's where they found the, the gold. There's, there was the gold mine there. Right underneath Adam's calendar, there's an ancient gold mine, literally right underneath it. <laughs> and across the, the what's known as the Barberton impact crater, you look from Adam's calendar, which is on the edge, there's a 300 meter drop down, and then eventually goes to about a, you know, almost a kilometer drop down in elevation uh, in this giant impact crater known as the Barberton Crater. And if you look across that from Adam's calendar to the other side, um, you, you see uh, what's, uh, you, first of all, you look over the pyramids. You can see the pyramids very clearly in the center of the pyramid of the, of the crater. And just right across to the other edge were the mountains. There, there, so there's a range of mountains that, that formed around the impact crater. And on the other side, opposite Adam's calendar against the mountain. That is where, where uh, Sheba gold mine is. Sheba gold mine. That's where they found the ancient cavern with the gold oozing out of the, the veins in the, in the gold, in, in the walls, out of the rock walls. Um, so why did I go there? Uh, oh, the Sphinx. So, so, you know, in the beginning, this is all just so bloody confusing.
what are these stones doing here? And next to Adam's calendar, when you drive to Adam's calendar, you drive past probably about 700 meters of just giant rocks and boulders, all granite, all made of, of, of dolerite, dolerite rocks of the strangest shapes with claw marks and scratch marks and weird looking skin-like things on them. And in the beginning, you have no idea what it is. You just think, oh, it's just erosion. But then, and then the Sphinx, the Sphinx looks like somebody carved this, you know, dolerite rock into a shape of a little Sphinx. But then everything changes. The moment I discovered the fossils and the fossilized body parts in January 2018 of creatures, humanoids, giants, up to 300 meters tall, suddenly I discovered the fossilized body parts and everything changed. And I realized that the body parts, whether they ribs, hearts, toes, fingers, teeth, skin, oh my God, uh, so many different body parts, uh, legs, etc. cetera. Um, and I realized that, that these fossils, sometimes with meat, petrified meat on it that is not turned to you know, stone, horn fells rock that these body parts turn into hornfell stone. Hornfell is a metamorphic rock. So it goes from being a body piece of you know, organic a leg bone of something. Uh, and suddenly it turns into a stone that is just quartz, dense quartzitic rock with lots of iron in it, the iron from the blood, obviously, of that creature, and then the quartz. So it's, um, it, and that's why they ring like bells. So you've heard, you've seen the videos of me ringing the stones like bells. And that's because it's now quartz and a lot of iron in it from the blood. And the moment I realized we're dealing with petrified body parts, fossils, it all just, the penny just dropped and everything became crystal clear. And the next time I went to Adam's calendar and I suddenly looked at the little Sphinx, I went, oh my God, that's not a, somebody didn't carve that. That's a bloody bone. It's a large bone of a large creature. That's why it's got this weird shape. But you first have to go on this journey of discovery, realize and, and, and learn what we're dealing with so that it's not a shock. And, and this is what I meant, putting the pieces of the puzzle together slowly but surely over many years. It doesn't all come at once. Is Moldavite one of the uh, stones or, or types of quartz that you've come across that's used in this uh, ancient uh, technology? I can't say. Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with that one. What, what I do have here is um, we have uh, the main, the main, the smaller uh, body parts up to probably maybe, you know, three tons or so uh, from little, little pieces like this to, you know, and teeth, teeth of giants. So teeth that are like a foot, a foot long and hearts and fingers and pieces of fingers so those turn, for some reason, those turn into hornfells, hornfells rock. And you can literally see the scratch marks and the bite marks when it was still a piece of meat, you know, and, and the scratch marks and, and the, the marrow, bone marrow coming out of the bone and some animal, animal was clawing, clawing and scratching at it, at, at it and then suddenly it turns to stone. And those turn to hornfells rock. And those are the ones that ring like bells, the smaller ones. But when you get to the large ones that are lying out in the open, that's where it just gets crazy because those have somehow turned into dolerite, which is some, it's not possible. It shouldn't be possible because dolerite is supposed to be part of the granite family. That's supposed to be an igneous rock pushed out of the ground over millions of years from hot melting lava and blah, 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 blah. That nonsense, all BS, all mainstream geology textbook brainwashing. So now we have physical evidence that Dolerite is, can, is a metamorphic rock. It's very important. This should, this should be taught at geology school. Dolerite is a metamorphic rock. Come and look at the physical evidence of our giant fossilized body parts that are now recognized as dolerite stone. So, yeah. So in, in terms of using these technologies, I mean, does one need to be skilled in alchemy or, or, or shamanic practices because this is 
uh, definitely something that requires understanding or connecting with the, the resonance, the, the hidden potential in the rocks and also within our own DNA. So how, how do you do that? Yeah, great question. And I suspect that has got a lot to do with our dumbing down. Remember the whole story of, of the Tower of Babel, you know, when the people built this big tower and, uh, and then uh, the, both the biblical story and the Sumerian text story are the same. You know, and, the, and the, the whole thing was that let's go down there and destroy their language because if they can do this, they can become like us. So somehow the people, the human beings in those days had a much higher knowledge of being able to construct and do things. And I suspect that that was the moment when they didn't destroy the language, they destroyed the frequency of the language, they destroyed our pineal gland. They started the process of dumbing down and destroying our DNA, shutting down parts of our DNA, shutting down our pineal gland, uh, so that we lose many of our ESP abilities and focusing abilities and manifesting abilities, and possibly through our DNA and our pineal gland, the capacity to focus our thoughts so that you could use those code-shaped tools and create a Sazer beam. Because if you can do that, you can cut mountains, you can cut down trees or giant trees that then turn to stone and look like giant mountains as a tree stump. Uh, all these things, because remember this, that if you have the capacity to focus your mind, which I have no doubt that ancients could do so powerfully that it goes through your, through your body, through your arm, through your hand, into the cone, and it produces a powerful Sazer beam. And Sazer beams are infinitely more powerful than laser beams, by the way, if you know, your, your viewers don't know this. And this is why they use Sazer beams and not laser beams. I suspect that's what, it's, that's what it seems like. Um, you, can, you can turn that Sazer beam into a weapon that is connected to the frequency of your thoughts. So if your thought is, I want to chop down that tree, and the frequency in that Sazer beam is the frequency of chopping down the tree. If the frequency is, I want to move that object from there to there, then the frequency in the Sazer beam is to move the object and not chop it down. So so it's definitely connected to the levels of consciousness that we had, that we lost, or that was beaten out of us or removed from our DNA. And, and I suspect that's when the, the, the poisoning and the dumbing, the poisoning of our, of our food, the poisoning of humanity, poisoning of our water and our soil and whatever else, and the manipulation of our pineal gland and our DNA to dumb us down so we forget who we are and become a species with amnesia, you know, bloody clue what happened or where we are going. Can, can you just explain what, what is a Caesar beam and also who was doing the dumbing down in particular? Who specifically was doing that? Right. So Caesar stands, for, uh, laser stands for light amplified by stimulated emission of radiation. It's a very stupid acronym, laser. That's what laser stands for, light amplified by stimulated emission of radiation. Really, can't you come up with something better? So it's focused light, right? It's focused light beams uh, that were treated in a specific way. Um, and Caesar is a Caesar beam, Caesar where, where sound is amplified and sound is a coherent beam of sound, a coherent beam of sound that you cannot see. A laser beam you can see, right? We can see light. Well, some light. Uh, we can see the light spectrum that we can see. So if there's a laser beam, oh, we find laser beams very uh, you know, entertaining and laser light laser shows and all this. It's fantastic. A laser beam is a whole different kettle of fish. And a laser beam, uh, okay, we didn't touch upon that yet. So a laser beam, a sound travels infinitely fast uh, because sound is connected to this primordial source code of resonance frequency of the primordial resonance of creation. And, and as Nassim Haramein showed, in his very famous uh, paper, I think 2008, uh, when, he, when he wrote about the torus and the, the zero point, the vacuum of the zero point, the density of the vacuum that he calls it, or the zero point, the density of that is infinite, infinite density. So the question is, uh, now I'm, I'm jumping track a little so people understand the power and the importance of Caesar beam technology. So the speed of light is restricted by the medium through which light moves. It's very simple. So the denser the medium, the slower the speed of light. 
So some, some mediums, light does not travel through wood or through metal. Light only travels through a medium that can propagate it. Um, so, but sound is the opposite. So when you put sound through, through water, it speeds up. Sound, I think, I think it's like eight times faster in water. I, I think, speak under correction. So sound travels eight times faster in water than it does, or is it 40 times, than it does in air? So the question is, how fast does sound move through an infinitely dense medium? The answer is infinitely fast. It's a very simple answer. So when sound travels through a vortex or, or, a, or a wormhole or a torus field or torsion field, all the same thing, a vortex field, torsion field, um, uh, 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 all, those, all those words that we've become accustomed to, um, and, and scalar energy, scalar fields, these are all uh, toroidal fields that that create that have this zero point energy in the middle. So the moment a sound frequency goes into that, it enters the infinite density of all the zero points connected to each other in creation. And that's, you know, you can call it the mind of God and mind of the creator, or the infinite connectedness of consciousness throughout all of creation, that where all information is shared instantaneously. So this is why ancient cultures used to be able to communicate with other beings across all space and time instantly, because the moment your thought goes into any torus, into the center of the torus, you've connected into the infinite network of zero points. And your those frequencies are available everywhere. And that's what we sometimes call ESP. I was just thinking about you and your phone. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> right? So, so now we come back to the, to the Sazer beams. So just keep that in mind because you know, I used to lecture on that whole thing because they don't teach you this at university. It's really important to understand these things and it's so bloody simple. We should teach that in primary school, not even high school. We should start kids off at the age of you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 to teach that those very basic principles, principles of sound and toroidal fields, which incidentally, I'm sure you know this, toroidal fields are the fundamental structure of everything in our creation, in our reality. Everything manifests Interoidal fields, torus, stone, torus shapes. That's why the torus stones are so important. So now the Sazer beam, the, the, the cone-shaped tool manifests a Sazer beam, which means that Sazer beam travels infinitely fast, instantly. And you can do with that anything you want. You can, you can take out planets, you can take out stars, you can you can just there's, there's a whole nother ball game. And we're just speculating right now what you can do with it. I think the industrial military complex has got a lot more information on it, which obviously we don't know about. But I have met some people that have worked with Sazer Beam technology. And let me tell you, they were very cagey, incredibly cagey about what they told me. And they were very scared, very, very scared. Every time they spoke about what they are doing, what their research is, and... Um, and how this technology is being used. And what really blew my mind is the one guy that I met, this was in Europe, he said they're, they're working with these Sazer beam technology and the Sazer technology. And he said, it's, it's really difficult to control. And, and they were, they were they're very, very careful and they, they're struggling to control it. So one of the things, um, uh, he told me is that they found that masking tape, like layers of masking tape, was the most effective way for them to slow down and neutralize the devastating effects of Sazer beam or Sazer technology. <laughs> so, wow, masking tape of all things. Anyway, this is all additional information that, you know, once you go down this rabbit hole, oh my God, it gets very exciting. And I love talking about it because ultimately this brings us to particle physics and quantum mechanics, which is become my, my sort of favorite subject and speciality. And, uh, and it all comes from studying ancient civilizations and ancient bloody gold mines here in South Africa. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, amazing research. I just wanted to uh, bring back this idea of Enki as being involved in this kind of like uh, uh, creation of humans, in storing genetic codes, uh, activating the pineal gra gra gland so that we can be uh, fully activated. I, I just wanted to get you to maybe share uh, your thoughts on you know, some of the sources that I've been uh, working with say that Enki has returned to our solar system and is, and is returning um, with the knowledge of how to activate this inherent genetic 
uh, blueprint that could uh, extend life, bring back per perfect health and so forth. So I just wanted you to you know, speculate uh, as to what it would mean if Enki did return and brought back this ancient knowledge that he encoded into human DNA. Yeah, thank you very much. I've also heard of that. I've heard that uh, in great detail. Uh, I, well, before I go in there, just pay attention that this is one of the images that, you know, this winged being, um, I'm not sure if this is a representation of Enki. There's so many different variations of it these days. But you can see holding the pine cone, which is very important. Uh, again, in there, I believe, is encoded the knowledge that our pineal gland has the capacity to focus and generate energy and focus energy in so, some sort of a beam. Um, so, but also telling us that the, 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 that they were using cone-shaped technology and the, the pineal glands and also the, the pine. And there was something about pine that I just recently discovered and it blew my mind and it completely slips my mind. It's brand new information like two or three months ago, I found this about pine trees and pine wood and pine sap and um, pine cones any case but pay attention there on his wrist is that little wristwatch that i said it's a magnetron wristwatch right that tells us they were they were generating energy somehow uh, with that little wristwatch and uh, and then what is missing it, it's sort of a hint of it is on his forearm uh, in the in the carvings in those stellar carvings that you find very clearly uh uh, you see the the, co the 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 cone that runs from his elbow all the way up into the the side of that little wristwatch. So that's very very heavily encoded uh, with um, with inf information about ancient technology. So as far as Enki coming back and so forth, um, you know, I I I don't really have much on that. I've been sort of just sitting on the sideline and listening, observing what people say. Um, okay, that's interesting, because I've been researching, you know, for, for, for sort of going in a different direction, uh, and and obsessed with the technology that I was discovering, uh, more so than, you know, whether Enki is coming back to activate this or that, you know, if that's the case, that's fantastic. And what I do have, though, however, is countless, I mean, not just 10 or 20, probably um, well more than 100 probably more than 200 psychics and visionaries and channelers that have come to me over, over the years and, uh, and told me that, that I have a very close connection to Enki. Uh, I don't want to become one of those people that, that start saying, oh, I'm the reincarnation of so-and-so and, -so and like, uh, but I'm just, I'm saying that they've, I've been told that I have a very close connection to Enki and that I carry that energetic line and whatever that is. And and I go, okay, wow, that's interesting. So maybe that's why I discovered all this stuff because I understand it. You know, it, I was the one that put it all together prior to me. All these geologists, archaeologists, and very smart people in South Africa, no one was able to put this together because they just didn't connect the dots. So somewhere in there is an interesting story. Um, and um, and I was also told that. All of this leads to something. And all of this leads to what we do with this knowledge and information. And, um, and that's really what I started to focus on, you know, lately. Uh, not lately, since 2005. Working on slave species of God, but at the same time, by, 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 you know, while I was researching the Sumerian clay tablets and all the other translations, and, uh, and just my God, this is unbelievable. We have the physical evidence here in South Africa. And then discovering the origins of money. And go, whoa, you know, you, the whole Sumerian kings lists and the kings list tell us about the, the, the primordial kings before the flood and then how long they lived, you know, 28,000 years here and 14,000 years there and 43,000 years there. And in total, 240 something thousand years that these kings lived before the flood. And then the flood came and then and then all other stuff started to happen. But what I realized is in those Sumerian kings list is in between the lines, they tell us how these first priest kings that were appointed by the gods, I assume the Anunnaki, uh, became the first kings on earth that created the royal bloodline. So now we know where the royal bloodline comes from. We know its origins. 
They were appointed by the gods. And they were probably larger. They were probably hybrids between humans and the gods. So they had more power. They had more ability. They were bigger. They were stronger. And they had fierce weapons. They had powerful weapons with which they could smite the people. Otherwise, why would anybody listen to them? You, this land belongs to me. You go plow that land and bring me all the food. No, screw you. But if, if I said, if you don't do that, I'm going to smite you, which they did. They said, if you don't do this, you'll be smited. <laughs> and they did a lot of smiting. So people feared them. Mm -hmm. And then, then we learn about that they started to build their temples that were impenetrable. And people, and from the temples, they made the laws and the rules. So it was the, it was the, it was the, the place of law that their rules were made and where they dispensed justice from their temple. So it was the court as well. And it became the bank where they created the first forms of money and they issued the first forms of money in the form of clay tablets in the form of promissory notes. And the moment I read that, I went, oh my God, this is modern banking in ancient times, creating promissory notes on clay the way we create promissory notes on pieces of paper. And that's when the penny dropped for me. I went, oh my God, money did not evolve out of thousands of years of bartering and trading to, to be this wonderful thing that helps humanity, you know, progress. No, money was introduced as a, as a fully evolved idea of enslavement and manipulation by these ancient priest kings that were very much smarter, obviously, than we are. And money was introduced fully and wholly as a, absolute tool of enslavement and that's when i realized oh my god we need to do something about this money structure because it's just a slavery system so while i was releasing slave species of god i was also formulating the ideas for the whole ubuntu book and contributionism parallel on parallel uh, tracks you know yeah, so you want to tell us about uh, your ubuntu book because i mean that's what you've been working on the last few years and um, alternative uh, banking and kind of like going small um, improving or strengthening local communities so you want to tell us about uh, ubuntu and your more recent research yes so um that's very important you know just to, just to recap all the stuff we spoke about the anunnaki the origins of humankind the gold mines and and all that stuff that's very important information and uh, and i used to for the last 14 years i've been or longer i've been doing these tours around the world talking about the ancient stuff talking about those discoveries but always ending up on on this note uh so now that we have all that knowledge about the origins anunnaki and all that other ancient stuff it's great knowledge, but what are we going to do with this knowledge? If we don't use this knowledge for the benefit of humanity, then it's just a waste of time. And if we know that money was created as a tool of enslavement, then we better get off our asses and do something about it. And that's when I started to talk about the idea of contributionism in 2005 already. And then that sort of grew in by 2008, 2009, it became a very became very vocal about contributionism and the Ubuntu philosophy, which is a, an, an African philosophy of community working together for the greatest benefit. People look after each other, take care of each other and work together so that they all thrive and, and, and survive and not just survive, but thrive and prosper. And so that became a, a very important part of my message. And that then grew into the Ubuntu movement uh, by 2012, by 2010, we then registered the political party. We would, went into politics, think, believing completely erroneously that we could inject a seed of consciousness into the political beast. And that didn't work at all. Uh, I realized that the moment you go into politics, you become an opposition and you oppose all the other political parties. And that's the last thing we should be doing, we should be doing right now is opposing each other and opposing people. Just enjoy the dogs barking in the background. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, that lasted for a few years and then it slowly but surely it evolved into what has now become known as the One Small Town Initiative, where we take the philosophy of contributionism, people contributing and working together and contributing towards the greater benefit of everyone in their community with their individual skills and talents, embracing the principle of Ubuntu, where we take care of each other and care and 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 help each other, and uh, and that has now grown and exploded into the One Small Town Initiative, uh, especially during lockdown. 
literally from 2020, uh, 2021, that's when people started to think. They were locked down and it started, made some people think. People that were obviously ready and prepared for this and ready for this journey. And uh, it was almost a blessing in disguise for the Ubuntu movement and the One Small Town Initiative. And now we have, um, we have about 40 ambassadors around the world in about 20 countries. Um, we have at least, I think, 15 small town initiatives. Um, our most exciting initiative is the one in Lebanon, of all places, unbelievable. Our ambassador, uh, ambassador in Lebanon, Fayez Mukarim, has performed absolute miracles. Um, we're about to launch our first one small town in the USA. This happened last week. We have several in South Africa. We have uh, in Wales, in New Zealand, in um, in Canada, in in uh, oh my God, I, I can't even think. Um, so it's just it's just happening all over the world now. It's an idea whose time has come, because people realize that we can't just sit sit and wait for someone to come and save us. We have to save ourselves. I think it's very important uh, looking at initiatives like that, the One Small Town Initiative. I know Catherine Austin Fitz has, has been emphasising small communities coming together, supporting each other, because I think, you know, what we're looking into the, the future hold for us is the development of these smart cities, which are going to be very centralised, using AI with uh, people connected uh, through these um, implants, through these neural links, where they, where they and it's all centralised, controlled. And so I think we need to go in the other direction of like something like what you're you're describing uh, this uh, one small town initiative and and I, and I think that's very important you know to, to this bigger picture too you know we've been talking about Enki the re, the poss his possible return but I think uh, what that represents is the return of that ancient science of alchemy and shamanism you know, going away from these centralized belief systems with uh, priests and popes into a kind of more individualistic expression of spirituality where you connect with source within and 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 connect with the uh, natural power around you, like in, in the rocks or in the these tor toroid rocks that you've been describing that I think, yeah, that's the way we need to go. Yeah, Michael, this is so important. Um, and this is, I think... This is why the One Small Town Initiative, is just, it's catching on. It's exponential. We've, we've had to slow down a little bit because uh, literally a, just a year ago, we launched the One Small Town Initiative a year ago and then realized, well, uh, we launched it a year ago with our new uh, cryptocurrency, our One Small Town token. So we've, we've got a solution for the global financial system as well uh, in, within the One Small Town family. With your own digital wallet, you can share your tokens free of charge with anybody do your trading, do whatever you want. This is our own, own. you know, I'll get back to that. But but I suddenly, so we launched it and we, we had the first One Small Town in Lebanon that just launched just more than a year ago in South Africa. And it started to suddenly attract attention. And um, then we realized, well, we don't have a mechanism to for this thing to be controlled and managed. How, how does it work? How do people know? You know, the whole One Small Town initiative of contribution is, is based that we, we launched this ourselves as a community and all we have to do is contribute three hours a week. Each one of us pledges to contribute three hours a week towards our businesses and upgrading our town. And when you start looking at the numbers, you have a town of 10,000 people and three hours a week, that suddenly gives us 30,000 hours of labor a week. 30,000 hours of labor. We can suddenly match Mercedes Benz or any multinational corporation with our labor force. And guess what? It's a free labor force. We're doing it for ourselves. We don't have to pay anybody. Mercedes-Benz can't afford to pay 10,000 people a week. They can't. It'll put them out of business. Well, we do it ourselves willingly, and that's the magic. That's the backbone of the One Small Town philosophy. It's that simple. So we choose what businesses we want to start, how much food we want to grow, how many laptops we want to build, and we start these businesses. At the same time, we get together every day and every week and start fixing our town, fixing the potholes, the parks, the orphanages, the old age homes, setting up food kitchens so we can feed those that don't have food and so forth. And it, it just starts to flow. But to manage all this, you need a very powerful IT or a platform and a blockchain. So since pretty much 
August last year, we started to, to build this blockchain of ours that can manage all of this. And it, it can do most of the functions. It's a very powerful tool already, but there's still a little, a few hiccups here and there. So we've, in a way, we've had to slow down the uptake of one small town until the blockchain is perfect and we don't have little surprise gremlins here and there. Because once this thing goes, literally within two years, we could have 100,000 small towns signing up on the blockchain wanting to do this very simple thing for themselves. And we provide the tools for the business plans, the project management, the online accounting system, the, the issuing of the infinity tokens to the people when they've contributed their three hours to their businesses or their community project. How do you measure it? How do you know whether they've been there and contributed their three hours? We've put all these mechanisms into place and it's very simple. It's very, very um, beautiful. Everybody gets their, their, at the end of the month, everybody gets a distribution of food that we grow. Everybody gets a distribution of profits from all the businesses that we've created. Ultimately, we want to make as much profit as we can because we need to fund this thing somehow, right? So our businesses are there to make profit while we benefit from what it is that we grow or manufacture at the same time. So in case people are confused, when we grow food, we grow as much food as we can. We keep some for ourselves that we need and the rest we sell and make profit. If we make laptops, we make laptops that we distribute to ourselves every four or five years. The rest of the laptops we keep selling to the world. And so it goes. So the businesses we start are not a bunch of hippies growing some food on some land. These are very hardcore, well-managed businesses that, that are aimed at making as much profit as possible. And that's what, that's what is attractive to investors. Because suddenly, they've got no labor force to pay. The only labor they need to pay is the management, the top few people in management of that company that are very good at managing that kind of business to make sure it profits as much as possible. The rest of the labor we as a community provide, whether it's the IT, the, 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 the accounting, the PR, the, the, the carrying, the, the driving, the security, the packaging, you know, the, the counting, we do that ourselves. We are, because we are the, we are 60 percent owners of those businesses. So in any one small town initiative, the community never owns less than 60% of the business that we start. The investors come in and they can only ever have 30% of the business. That means we remain the majority shareholders of all the businesses that we start. So we can never ever be undermined by any outsider that tries to compete with our businesses. And that is the attraction to the investors because the investor knows once they go into an invest into this town, they go into partnership with the whole community, not just with one potentially crooked individual. That means that if their partner is the community, no one can ever come in and undermine their business because the community won't allow it. And this is how we bring the power back to the people in the small towns, from agriculture to technology to, to healthcare. And I'm saying healthcare specifically, Michael, because we're about to launch our very first one small town health and wellness center in Ras El in Lebanon. It is beautiful. It is five five-story building with 40 world-class doctors that are specialists in all kinds of applications, mainstream doctors that have already contributed their, their time to our health and wellness center. It's gonna become a global example of how we can take care of our own health and create health tourism to our town and make millions of dollars profit for ourselves from that very unique service that we provide. So, Michael, where do people go if they want to find out more about your initiatives, learn more about your books, do one of your tours? Where, where would you recommend they go? What website? Well, um, firstly, I'm not doing any more tours because it's just those days are over. You know, I, I did 14 years of tours. And um, so, unfortunately, for people that didn't catch me during that period of my life, um, that era is over. I'm now fully focused on on, uh, on one small town because it's it's more than a full-time job it's a 16 hour a day job so um and it's just incredibly inspiring and motivating and enthralling every day uh, the best website to go to for one small town is one small town.org and go there explore watch all the videos watch all the q a videos read as much as you can get up to speed with where we are what we're doing and so and join us become a member of one small town just click on become a member 
go to the one small town it the, the blockchain platform um, fill in the form and that means you are officially a member and when you become a member you automatically have your digital wallet attached to your account which means you can buy infinity tokens or somebody can send you infinity tokens and you can start sharing them with any other one small town member free of charge so you can do that on onesmalltown.org become a member and then to find out more about the ancient civilizations and all that my other website michaeltellinger.com that's the one that has all that kind of information on it and uh, i also have a private channel video channel uh, that you can sign up to and the link is on michaeltellinger.com well, I want to thank you, Michael, for coming on to ExoPolitics today and our best wishes for all your future projects. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Michael. It was great talking to you. Thank you for this opportunity. You have been listening to ExoPolitics today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com. Mm-hmm.